another night in their long run of games against the Nationals for the New York Mets tonight. They knocked the Presidents back on their heels yesterday, and they'll try and keep the good times rolling today, trying to stay in that bubble and get some more victories in D.C. At Nationals Park in Washington, the New York Mets play the Washington Nationals. The Mets last night gained a game on Washington. They're seven behind with 49 to play. And a pleasant good evening, everybody, and welcome to D.C. Gary Cohen, Ron Darling with you tonight as the Mets play the middle game of their series against Washington. Last night, the Mets posted a 6-1 to one win. Tonight, they'll hand the ball off to John Neese, who has been struggling since a stint on the disabled list. You know, more than struggling, I think that when you get a pitcher like Jonathan Neese, he'll say, listen, I'm not panicking. I'm trying to get myself back in pitching shape. Well, the mulligans are over, really, for Jonathan Neese. 0-3, they need him to be a leader on this pitching staff. If they're going to make a run, they're going to have a chance to win a lot of games, go 15-5 and five or 10-5 and five or anything they're going to need him to be the leader of the pitching staff he has not been that so far and he's going to have to start now in the otherwise very powerful Washington rotation Doug Fister fills an interesting niche he's the one sinker ball pitcher the guy who doesn't throw hard you know he was 12 and 30 when he was with Seattle which was a bad team and ever since he's left there he's got 42 wins he's a guy that has you know six eight he's got the great angle on the ball he's a strike thrower doesn't walk anyone and great competitive juices it's gonna be fun to watch him tonight so it's Nice against Fister on the mound. Nice hoping to get as much defensive help as Zach Wheeler did last night. Wheeler settled down nicely, but he wouldn't have been victorious without some great defense. Yeah, Zach really needed it. This it was early against Jose Lobatone and late coming in. The wind knocked out of him. He's been like that all season long. Eric Campbell. A guy that you never thought infielder turned outfielder would come up with this big throw. Great tag by Darno, and the double plays were key. Two of them were turned by the Mets last night. Double plays have been hard to come by for the Mets this season. Turning those two really was the difference for Wheeler and the Mets last night. So Wheeler's good fortune continues. The Mets hoping for the same in Washington tonight. All the action coming your way on SNY. Hyundai leaves the rest wanting. Find out why by visiting buyhyundai.com today.
By GEICO, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit GEICO.com for a free rate quote. By Optimum, presenting Mets games in crystal clear HD. By City, City cards can get you in on the action and closer to the game with access to special benefits at City Field this season. Visit Mets.com slash City to learn more. And by your Tri Honda dealer, hurry to your local Tri Honda dealer for great deals on the 2014 models. Boys to Men is coming to City Field for a concert after the Mets Cubs game Saturday, August 16th. As part of the Mets concert series presented by Dwayne Reed, catch Boys to Men live in concert August 16th. For tickets, visit Mets.com slash concerts. Mets upcoming schedule brought to you by Honda. Mets in the midst of a long stretch against the Nats. Another game tomorrow. Three more at City Field next week. Four games in Philadelphia in between. Mets then have the Cubs come in for four games after the Nats are at City Field. That's what's coming up tonight. Mets trying to make it two straight in D.C. In the shadow of the Capitol. First pitch is coming up from Nationals Park. Down to D.C. Getting autographs. Anthony Recker obliging. And he's ready for the next one. It's nothing more cool than getting an autograph, right? When you come to the ball game. Unless you get a baseball. Well, that's better, right? That's, that's okay. the next step up. Doug Fister getting ready to take the mound. Meanwhile, we'll let you know that New York Mets baseball on SNY is powered by Verizon. Create, share, and save every Mets moment all season long with the latest devices and accessories from Verizon, America's largest and most reliable network. It's very, very funny that I can uh, work that magic there, but I can't tuck in my shirt. Very talented. <laughs> I think you were just styling. Uh, bad style. Geico right. starting lineup for the Mets tonight. Kirk Neuenheis gets a start. Just came back from Vegas yesterday. Had a pinch hit RBI single in last night's game. And he gets the start in left field. Curtis Granderson after a night off back in the lineup in right field. 
as the Mets will face Doug Fister for only the second time ever. I was trying to say those numbers in the pregame 12 and 30 while he was a Seattle Mariner where he came up with he's 42 and 23 cents with Detroit and Washington. These are his Toyota numbers on the season. His last seven starts five and one with a 2.27 ERA. And here's the course light defense for the Nationals Harper Span and Worth very talented very athletic outfield Rendon Desmond Espinosa gets to start uh, Estrubal Cabrera on the bench and LaRoche at first base who had a couple of hits in last night's game and Jose Lobaton behind the plate. Curtis Granderson getting set to lead off and I was thinking today the Mets are being presented with an opportunity that is rarely afforded a team in their position at this point of the season. They're five games under 500 but because this division continues to struggle the way it has they've got a chance and they've got all these games left against the Nationals. They probably shouldn't be in this position but through the the lack of the dominance of others they are. You know, I, I, exactly. And if I were the manager or at least the team leader, I'd be boys. This is our chance. Okay. We frittered away a lot of games. We haven't done what we've had to do, but we still are here. Let's just go crazy. The Nats at nine games over 500, leading the division. The Braves this afternoon lost their eighth in a row in Seattle. So they're only two games over 500. Fister's first pitch of the night. Granderson takes a fastball for a strike and expect a lot of that. Fister is a strike thrower they faced him last year at City Field when he was in a Tigers uniform and he had a typical Fister outing in that he gave up a bunch of hits eight hits in six innings but the Mets only got one run against him see that cutter into uh, Granderson left handed hitters be prepared he is going to pound you in all game long two in a row well, when your fastball tops out at 88 miles an hour, you really have no choice but to do that, right? Yeah, but he's got that long arm. He's 6'8". The ball jumps on you. Granderson floats one into shallow right. Worth coming on, and he slides to make the catch. And that's the first out of the night. No one has perfected the slide on the routine catch more than Jason Worth. And I'm only kidding. He's such a good outfielder, and I know what some outfielders feel that almost braces them, makes it a little easier to make that catch. He had one fall in front of him on a sliding attempt last night on a base hit by Zach Wheeler. This time, Worth able to make the connection. Well, here's Daniel Murphy who with three hits last night, raised his batting average to 300 on the year. Murph, ninth in the National League in batting, leading the league in hits with 137. Back to back multiple hit games after a day off on Sunday and he grounds one toward the middle of the diamond Espinosa playing second base throws him out. Espinosa a better defender than as Cabrera who played there last night better defender Espinosa is fun to watch if he could somehow make more contact he'd be an everyday player with every team in baseball that's how the kind of talent this young man has and originally a shortstop in college moved to second but you can see that shortstop arm. So two quick outs and nobody on and now David Wright David one for five last night drove in the first med run. David's had a hit in each of the last four games but still not looking like you expect David Wright to look. Right on that back line. And Fister pours one in for a strike. When the Mets faced Fister last year, David was hurt with a hamstring injury, so this is his first time facing him in the regular season. And quickly, Fister ahead 0 2. Now, David has continued to hit the lefties since the All Star break, but has not had any success against the right handers. There are his overall numbers, and since the break, even worse, hitting just 132 against right handers. Everyone has a book on the umpires. Mets have a book on Larry Vanover. Be ready to hit. He calls strikes early and often. And it's on the outside corner. David caught looking. Out of your mouth. And into the into the record books. <laughs>
Only changed Danny Espinosa at second base. He's hit lefties well this year, so he's in the lineup against John Neese. Otherwise, the same unit as last night for the Nats, who've lost two straight. Well, uh, John has traditionally, you see the numbers by Caesars, but traditionally he's always pitched pretty well against the uh, Washington Nationals, although he gave up five runs and a start against them in May. Denard Spann will lead things off. Spann one for four last night, extending his streak of reaching base to 31 straight games. He is having himself a terrific year, and Spann takes a fastball for a strike. Spann, Rendon, and Worth for the Nats were held to one run despite eight hits, four walks, and a wild pitch last night. So they were not able to make much of plenty of opportunities. That's their perspective. Chopper, tough play for Murphy, and he throws out the speedy span. Nice play for Murph, one away. Speedy span, I like that alliteration. Nice play by Murph because he was in a little bit instead of deep and read that off the bat extremely well and made a difficult play look easy. He got some mustard on the throw. By the way, Murph had maybe the line of the year post game yesterday. He was talking about the ball oh, that he oh, hit oh. that went under as Drubal Cabrera's glove that looked off the bat like a double play and turned into a two run hit. He re he referred to his emotions as panic to elation in mere nanoseconds. <laughs> That's great. I'm I, uh, Murph just let me know I'll, I'll retire and you come straight up here. He's going to take one of our jobs one of these days. <laughs> Anthony Rendon a number two batter in the order. Rendon won for four last night hitting 280 on the year having a fine first full year in the major leagues. Off speed hit deep to right center back Lagares near the wall leaping can't get it. Granderson plays the carom and Rendon into second base with a one out double. 30th double of the year for Anthony Rendon. Well, one a nice try by Lagares. He knew that it was futile at some point because he couldn't get there. He just braced himself for to banging up against that fence. But the thing about Rendon is that in, a, in an age where everyone is such a mechanical hitter, he is just the hands eye coordination kind of see the ball, hit the ball. It's fun to watch. So Jason Worth with a first inning RBI chance. Worth one for four last night, a double. Also got thrown out of the plate, trying to score on an Adam LaRoche base hit. One of many plays last night that the Mets were able to turn to keep the lead and eventually pull away. And he fires on the inside corner. Well, you're right about Larry Vanover. It doesn't take much. I mean, if I were still pitching, he would be my friend, <laughs> my good friend. Swing the bats, boys. And Worth does. Senator Field, late break for Lagares. That's going to fall for a hit. Rendon read it well, and he will score the first run of the night. A blue pit for Jason Worth brings in the game's first run, and the Nationals have a 1 0 lead. Well, very similar to the run last night that the Mets got when Zach Wheeler dumped it over the head of Cabrera. And the good part about this is not the hit. It's the read by Rendon. See how he checked that and never, ever second guessed himself. He made the read. He knew it was going to fall in. That's the reason he scored the run. So a rough beginning for John Neese. He's thrown six pitches. He's already down a run. And the Nationals, very much like the Giants in Nice's last start, being very aggressive early in the count. Last start, Nice had 13 plate appearances against him that lasted only one pitch. I mean, think about that. <laughs> that is the, the most one pitch plate appearances against any pitcher in the major leagues in nine years. So. What does that tell you? Well, it, it, it tells it tells me that teams around the league have decided the way to get Jonathan Neese is that you want to swing at the first three pitches. Because he is going to throw of the first three pitches, you're going to get one to hit. What John has to do, and we saw it there with Worth, he gets the first pitch strike. But as you get strikes and you get one in there, you've got to make the plate smaller. He continues to throw the ball on the plate. Not really. I'm not making my point. I'm not making my point. My my point is, you you are using the whole plate on your first pitch, but if you get a strike, 
then you could start throwing it to a paper cup on the outside or inside up or down. LaRoche hits one deep to right center. Lagaris back looking up and it's out of here. Adam LaRoche who was in a slump when this series began got on base four times last night and he socks his 14th home run of the year and the Nationals jumping all over John Neese in the opening inning it's three nothing Washington. And I guess it gets back to what you were talking about Gary when you asked me is that John hasn't learned from his last start he continues to just pump the ball in there for strikes and uh, these hitters are too talented. If you continue to throw the ball over the middle or throw it for strikes then it becomes BP for these hitters. That is only the second home run LaRoche has hit against the left hand pitcher this year. But it's his third home run against John Neese and only 16 career at bats. And a lefty lefty matchup feels very comfortable. Ian Desmond 0 for 3 last night. So the Nats jumping out very quickly. Double single two run homer and Neese's night off to a very difficult start. John in his three starts since coming back from the DL 0 and 3 and this oh. one's a rocket to center but right at Lagares for the second out. So Desmond hitting a bullet but Neese gets a better result there. Well, we talked about the defense in last night's game which was excellent. Alexis defense tonight. Neuenheis gets a start in left Lagares and Granderson back in the lineup right to Hada Murphy Duda. Let's put that on tape so I don't have to say it anymore hmm. and Darnell behind the plate. Now it's Bryce Harper who looked just awful at the plate last night when 0 for 4 struck out three times. Harper's played 30 games since coming back from a two month stretch on the disabled list with a thumb injury. He's hitting 214 since coming back. And he throws a fastball by him. And watched his back foot. It's closer to the plate than it was last night. Very interesting as we, we've heard he's changed his stance many times from game to game but that back foot is closer to the plate trying to get to that outside corner. Needless to say there's been unending speculation here in Washington about what is ailing Bryce Harper and you know what most people want to know is is his thumb which required surgery in April still a factor in what's going on with him. You know what I saw last night Gary when he had that meltdown at first base when the ball did not go out Eric Campbell caught it on the warning track. You know what that tells me he's a young player who's trying to play catch up to a bad season. He wants to hit the five home runs in a game to get back on and it's not going to happen. Well he's still only 21 years old. Rookie of the year two years ago. To Tom All Star, but the numbers have come down since a very hot start last year. It's hard to live up to the chosen one, by the way. I just think I remember there was a year, and I know the story because I was told by both participants, Jorge Posada was having a, a tough first half hit in, in the 200s. And Joe Torre said, hey, listen, you're not going to have that high average. Just drive some runs in. And he did. Nice failed to cover. Duda had to do it himself and does a nice ballet move to avoid contact with Harper to get Nice through the inning. Rocky start for John Nice. Three nothing Washington after one.
off the second inning against Doug Fister, who required only nine pitches to carve up the Mets in the first. Due to one for five last night, a bloop single to drive in a run. And he takes wide from Fister. Travis Darno, Kirk Newenheis to follow. Change up in for a strike one and one. And there's Darno on deck. Two balls and a strike to do to Fister's year got off to a late start this year he had a strained lat muscle didn't make his first start for the Nats till May the 9th and yet he's already won 10 games. Hmm. Doesn't have enough innings to qualify for the ERA lead as Duda rips one into center for the Mets first hit of the night. So a leadoff single for Lucas Duda. That was nice hitting by Duda. Why because he waited out Fister. The pitches he saw in this at bat, he gets a little changeup, and Fister doubles up on the changeup for the strike. 1-1, one, one, tries to come in, misses. That gives Duda the count. What you want to do if you're a left-handed hitter, you need Fister to be up and out over the plate. And if you if you get in that situation, more often than not, you're going to hit a BB. So the Mets have a leadoff base runner, now Travis Darno. Darno one for three with a double, also hit by a pitch last night. And he takes a strike. Travis just two for his last 21 after a hot streak. And playing every day. And he pulls one and a nice pickup by Rendon. Espinosa with the turn for the double play. Well, just uh, another hard hit ball by Darnell, but just right at Rendon. And just the wonderful turn around the horn. This is one of those. He played right in front of him, short hopped it, accurate throw, and Espinosa's got that great arm at second base. Nice try by Lucas, who tried to break it up. Got Espinosa to leave his feet, but the ball was already on its way. Got kicked in the back for his efforts. <laughs> So just like that two out of nobody on for Kirk Neuenheis. Neuenheis getting the start in left field today after coming off the bench last night having arrived from Vegas on one hour sleep to get an RBI single as a pinch hitter. <laughs> didn't, didn't bother him he hit a BB up Blake Trinan. Yeah, he's used to it. <laughs> By the way Trinan back in the minors now as we speculated last night. Trying and sent down to make room for Matt Thornton, who was claimed on waivers from the Yankees by the Nats. Verizon trivia question for tonight. Mets player with the single season record for intentional walks. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of, of one guy, but he had a lot of good hitters around him, so maybe that is not the person. The last. Not last, but before this group of players, the last great player. Foul tip held by Lobatone, and Fister has his second strikeout. Three nothing Nats in the second.
Danny Espinosa leads off the home second for Washington. And he swings at the first John Neese offering and fouls it away. Espinosa has played most of the second base for the Nats this year. That was not really the plan. The plan was for Rendon to play most of the second base, but Ryan Zimmerman has been hurt on a couple of occasions. First a thumb and then a hamstring. So Espinosa making his 72nd start at second base tonight. I don't know if he can be taught to make more contact because he's a powerful young man as Jose Lobaton on deck. And when he makes contact, he can hit the ball as far as anyone on this Nationals team. The problem is he doesn't make enough contact because everything else he does in this game, his baseball instincts, his defense, they're all A1. Can't make contact on any of those three fastballs, and Nice has his first strikeout. Can we show that replay again? Watch this leg kick. It's almost like a, 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 a Jackie Gleason, and away we go. Watch this leg kick. Country on the front foot, folks. You don't usually see this. And away we go. <laughs> Halfway to being a rocket. He doesn't work in the winter. We could use him. Christmas show. Jose Lobatone takes outside for ball one. Lobatone starting for the second straight night. Wilson Ramos away on paternity leave. His wife gave birth to a baby girl yesterday. And so right now the Nats have something that I'm not sure we've ever seen anywhere else. They've got two switch hitting catchers. Huh. Lobatone and Sandy Leone, his backup. Is it me or are there less switch hitters uh, than there used to be? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I remember one time in the early 90s when the Mets had six switch hitters in their yeah. lap. You don't, you don't see that anywhere anymore. Broken bat. Murphy runs it down nicely and throws out Lobatone two away. And Murphy's made a nice play coming in and now going to his left. Follow every Mets game with MLB.com at bat on your favorite mobile phone or tablet. Get live look ins, instant replays, scores, stats, audio, free MLB.tv game of the day, and more. Download on the App Store or visit Mets.com today. Here's another thing we see more than ever before yeah. pitchers who throw one way and bat the other way. Yeah, you, you never did in those days. Fister, right hand pitcher, left hand batter, and he takes a strike. Fister, one for 26 at the plate. Of course, he spent all of his career in the American League before this season. I remember when David Cohn first came to the Mets, they said, you're not hitting left-handed. Uh, you can only hit righty. He said, well, I can only hit lefty. Then we watched him hit, and he couldn't hit either way. Um, and he broke his thumb or broke his finger on the bunt against the San Francisco Giants. And At Adley Hamaker. Everyone just felt awful. But uh, David turned into a, a better hitter, at least a contact guy. David has a line in the Mets record book. He was the first pitcher ever to get a pinch hit in Mets history. Happened oh. in Montreal back in the early 90s. That's just so wrong <laughs> in so many ways. <laughs> you know, like like the first no hitter is Santana. I'm fine with that. Right. I think Tom Seaver's fine with that. Maybe he's not fine with it. He probably wanted his own. But that that's something wrong with that. <laughs> Tejada backs off and throws out Fister and Nice. Has himself a one, two, three second inning. After two in DC, three nothing Nationals. Only playing George. <laughs>
walked off against Doug Fister. Lagares one for four last night, hitting 414 over his last eight games. It'll be Lagares, Tejada, and Nice for the Mets against Fister, who lost a heartbreaker to the Phillies his last start. Fly ball foul down the right side. Fister went seven innings against the Phils, allowed two runs, six hits, lost the game two to one. See Fister, he's coming off the mound. You're like, what is he doing? He's usually a quick worker. The reason he's doing that is because Espinosa and LaRoche went after that foul ball a little bit, a little bit of a wind sprint. He's letting them get back, get their breath, and now ready to go again. Nice easy hop for Espinosa, and he throws out Lagares one away. Well, Doug Fister, as a Seattle Mariner, was 12 and 30. Why was he 12 and 30? Well, the Seattle Mariners were terrible. <laughs> he had a 3.81 ERA with Seattle. Then they traded him to Detroit, and all of a sudden he became a winning pitcher. He also became a better pitcher. Yeah, well, you know what? When the team is scoring you some runs, it's funny how you get a little more aggressive. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're pitching behind the eight ball all the time, when you're pitching with a team that not only was not very good, they did not score runs. And that's one of the reasons Felix Hernandez probably won't ever reach 300. Other way, Felix Hernandez again last night, eight innings, one run, four hits. So he struggled last night. 15 straight starts, seven innings or more, two runs or less. Just extends his major league record. They had an extra large King's Court in Seattle last yeah. night. It took up like eight sections. He's uh, not only is he a great competitor, he's very animated on the mound. You know, of course, he and Kershaw are probably the two best pitchers in the game. But he looks like he's having fun out there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the Seattle fans just love him to death. One two to Tejada and it's low and away. Ruben one for four last night. John Neese on deck. So the Mets hitters have to know this uh, almost through the first time in the lineup. Left handed hitters he's going to pound in. Right handed hitters he's going to pound in. So I don't need the, the book. Uh, the videotape or anything. If you're watching the game you know exactly what Fister's going to do. On the outside corner, another wide strike called by Larry Vanover. And Fister has his third strikeout. Same pitch that he threw to David Wright. The thing about this pitch is he starts it on the outside corner. It comes back about an inch or two, and he's getting the call from Larry Vanover. So two out and nobody on. Now Nice, who's one for 31 at the plate this year. Quite a come down after hitting over 200 last year. And he takes a strike. I think Larry Vanover called that a ball because he was just kind of sick of calling strikes. <laughs> Let's answer our Verizon trivia question. Mets record for intentional walks in a season. Ojo. In 88. Which wasn't even one of his good years. Wow. It was an odd year guy. Was he hitting eighth a lot in 88? He might have been. He might have been hitting eighth in that Probably lineup. So yeah. So it's a lot like Ruben Tejada's yeah. intentional walks. Except there's a reason to walk Howard. Just inside the full count to Nice. Curtis Granderson would be next. Another easy play for Espinosa, and so Fister's faced the minimum through the first three innings. That's got him some early runs, and Fister so far making him stand up. 3 0.
fly ball. Sandberg, Cubs win. And Deuce Gossie has a 300 save of his career. The Cubs have even up the series by beating the Phillies seven to four. Infinity bring us this date in baseball history 1988 on this date Goose Gossage got number 300 of his 310 career saves now the thing about Gossage's saves they weren't ninth inning saves yeah, they no. were seventh eighth and ninth inning saves uh, he used to tell me I was his teammate in Oakland he routinely if the pitcher got in trouble had the bases loaded in the seventh he'd come in with no outs and have to pitch the rest of the way. Now early on in his career Goose made some starts with the White right. Sox but he had as many as one hundred and forty two innings in relief one season. Think about that. I mean routinely guys have sixty seventy innings closers these days. He started with the Pirates right. Uh, he went from the White Sox to, to, the, Pirates. to the Pirates. Right. OK. All right. And then to the Yankees he ended up pitching for nine different teams. Denard Spann leading off in the home third grounded out to Murphy his first time up. And he finds the inside corner. Ball and a strike. Deuce was in Scottsdale to try to make the Oakland A's team. I forget what year it was. I want to say 1992. And, uh, you know, he just had a fantastic spring training. He was still bringing it at 95 plus. Line the other way, and Span's got a hit. And he just keeps on getting the board. 32 straight games, Span has now reached base. And we were talking to a lot of the people here in Washington. They said he has just been their MVP, their best player, and is locked in right now, evidenced by the numbers. I was just saying really quickly that in that spring training, I got to spend a lot of time with Goose. We were one of the few people that our families weren't there. And he was the nicest guy I'd ever met to the point where Carney Lansford, the third baseman for that team, went up to him and said, Goose, I wish I had known. You were such a nice guy. It might have been easier to get a hit off of you because <laughs> everyone was so fearful of him. He was certainly intimidating. There's no question about that. Anthony Rendon doubled off the wall in right center his first time up. Spans also hit in 10 straight games now, in addition to that 32 game on base streak. What I remember about Goose is that really early in his career, the White Sox had he and Terry Forster. That's right. And they were both starters at that time. And they traded them both to the Pirates for Richie Zisk. Well, they needed some offense, decided to go with Richie. Remember, or don't forget, that was a change up there 2 0 by Jonathan Neese for a strike. They also had Wilbur Wood on that staff. Right. So they had a knuckleballer and two guys throwing 100. Now it wasn't 100 in those days folks with the guns but it would certainly be 100 now. Well. Wilbur Wood. With Wilbur they. Only needed maybe one or two other starting pitchers. Unbelievable right. Start both ends of a double header. Span with 23 steals. And that just missed. Nice thought he was going to get that call from Larry Vanover but didn't. And now it's three and one. Well, Jonathan's thrown that cutter that is usually swung at, and it's just inside. He's missing maybe by two inches, where Fister is two inches to the good. Rendon hits one past the mound, but Tejada is there. The flip to Murphy, and the low throw, Duda handles that, and they turn two. Nicely done by Tejada, Murphy, and Duda. Well, Matt Williams had a chance, especially with Rendon up. To maybe run span there, he decides not to, and the Mets turn the easy double play. I mean, Tejada. I don't know what else to say. I don't think we talk about his defense enough, but certainly uh, as good a defense he's ever played in a Mets uniform the past three months. Solid, absolutely solid. So two out of nobody on now. Jason Worth, who had a pop fly single that drove in a run in the first. Now it's got all three runs against. Nice in that first inning. Rendon doubled off the fence. Worth blooped a single for one run, and Adam LaRoche cranked one off the facing of the upper deck for two more. And John misses with a changeup and falls behind two and out.
And now 3-0. Could have watched out here. Last night he had a 3-0 he took. Ball was down the middle. He shook his head like I should have been swinging at that pitch. So if you're watching the game last night, be careful here. Uh, nice walks him on four pitches. First walk of the night for John. They play I walk the line here <laughs> when someone gets a bases on ball. Johnny Cash version. Probably better that than Folsom Prison Blues. <laughs> yeah. Here's Adam LaRoche who homered his first time up. Only his second home run against the lefty this year, but his third in 16 at bats against Nice, so he's had Nice's number. LaRoche had been in a slump before this series began, but he's been on base now five straight times in the two games against the Mets. Walk the line, Folsom City, Folsom Prison Blues. They have a Souza. That's the closest to a boy named boy, Sue. Boy named Sousa. <laughs> I was I was thinking he would be more in line for uh, you know some marching music. John Phillips. One two to LaRoche and he fouls it away. You always want to knock on wood when you make these comments at the ballpark, but I don't remember a time in August with this kind of weather in Washington, D.C. It's it's so delightful. I wouldn't say cool is the word, but just so pleasant here in the evenings. Temperature in the mid 70s. Pulled down to first. Dude has got it. And that ends the inning. So he's able to work around a single and a walk in the third. Mets come up in the fourth down 3 nothing. You're watching, turn your head. <laughs> Keith has made it quite clear cotton candy is not at the top of his uh, snack list. But I know he's watching tonight. He texted us because I said maybe Hojo was batting eighth. He texted, said Hojo batted seventh that year, which makes sense. Elster was probably batting eighth. Right off the end of the bat, Granderson with the number. To Rendon for the first out. And Keith, if Elster wasn't batting eight, don't text him again. I don't want to be wrong twice. <laughs> well, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, it was, right. It was Elster's 
first full year that year. In first full year, and you know he was a hitter hitting a, a little bit over two, uh, uh, over 200. But it wasn't even that. Is that Hojo had that threat? He was the home run guy. I'd have to say Hojo of all the people I ever played with, strongest man per pound yep. I ever played with. Here's Murphy who grounded out his first time up. Well, Hojo had some spectacular years with the Mets. Usually in the odd numbered years, 89, 91, he was just off the charts, 30 30 each year. Well, what I always get from fans, Mets fans, when they, if I meet them, haven't met me before, how tall I am. They can't believe how tall I am. I always have the same answer. We're all tall. I mean, that's kind of how it works. But I know Hojo always gets from fans. They can't believe how small he is. Right. And right. he's not he's not small. He's husky and strong or whatever. But uh, he's not tall. He's 5'9"-ish or so. I think he'd take offense at the 5'9". He can take all the offense he wants. He's 5'9". <laughs> I don't care how <laughs> offense he takes. Just inside to Murphy and it's two and two. And he's not going north just like all of us. All right, see, and now I got it. <laughs> not going to check and see where he's listed. I, I bet he's listed at 5'11 or so. He can be listed at whatever he wants to be listed at. <laughs> well, that brings up a whole other conversation. <laughs> Strike three called. And the Mets just keep taking pitches, and Larry Vanover keeps calling them strikes. And Fister's got four strikeouts, and Murph is frustrated. Well, I mean, if I if I know it uh, going into the game, certainly they have to know it. You know, this pitch, Murphy thinks it's uh, definitely down and in. Well, it could be both. But Vanover is telling you since the first pitch that he's going to call it. So who 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 is who is wrong here? Is it Vanover or is it the inability to know going in that that's what's going to happen? I don't know. I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of hitting coaches will say that there's a zone that you got to concentrate on. Here's David Wright with two out, but that changes with two strikes. I, I would agree, but uh, I, I don't think that. Uh, some hitters believe that they feel as though I have an unbelievable eye at the plate and if I don't think it's a strike it's not a strike. Well the other piece of that of course is that the umpires are much more closely evaluated for their ball and strike calls than they ever have been before. They've got the sophisticated equipment in every ballpark where they can grade the umpires a little pop fly behind first and that's going to fall for a base hit for right takes a turn and holds on at first base. A chance. No sense taking a chance down by three runs. So David has a hit in five straight games and a lot of them have looked kind of like this. Well it's a hanging breaking ball and and uh, David I don't know how quite to describe that. Hit he just uh, kind of had an upper swing and didn't catch it right and dumps it into right field. But, Sand wedge. Well you know every hitter will take it. There's a lot of line drives that are caught so. What I was going to say is you know umpires have always had variances. It's always been a, a book on umpires because you know they all call the strike zone somewhat differently. But wouldn't you think that if you have an outlier, which is what Vanover appears to be, that he would be catching heat from his superiors if he calls strikes that aren't really strikes? Uh, uh, absolutely. You know he 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 has uh, his report card that he gets. So um, you know obviously, well, who knows? But the, the thing is, is that anyone can get a report card. I don't know what happens right. if you get a bad report card. You know, do you change? Uh, doesn't look like you lose your job. Well, that, I guess that's the question. Yeah. Is there any downside to getting a bad report card? That's a good curveball by Fister, and it's 0-2 to Duda, who had a hard single to center his first time up. Um, just check baseball reference. Yes. 5'11". 5'11", 178, according to uh, baseball reference. Just say. <laughs> I wish we had had this conversation before we went to Seattle. <laughs> we could we could measure. Oh, I would I would have just taken someone who is five nine, five ten. I'll even give Hojo five ten. I got to give him five ten if he says he's five eleven. But there's no way he's five eleven. Hojo, well, I, you know I love you. Well, my question is, who decides how a player gets listed? Do they actually? Measure him, or does a player say, "I'm six four. That's what I want to be listed." Exactly. As. What you do is that uh, in in spring or one of your first springs, they'll say, "Hey, what are you anyways?" I'm six three one ninety five. Okay, that stays with you 
forever. Forever. You see any card that I'm in when I first came to the major leagues probably was 185 pounds. Duda finds a hole for his second hit of the night. Wright will pull on its second so back to back two out hits for Wright and Duda and that'll get Darno to the plate as the tying run. Boy it's just so fun to watch Duda emerge uh, in this last month and a, a little bit takes a fastball for a strike 0 oh and 2 and Fister with a bad pitch up but then tries to go away with a slow curveball. That's what he swung through. So even within an at bat he's making an adjustment. Fun to watch. So here's Darno who hit the ball hard his first time up but a bullet one hopper that Rendon turned into a 5 4 3 double play. That's now with three hits against Fister. And the first pitch changeup is down ball one. So I was saying when I started I was 6 3 about 185 when I finished with Oakland I was 6 4 probably 230 at that point. I've always been 6 4 195 in the card always any card you pick up it's 6 4 6 3 195. So what you're saying is that baseball is no different from basketball everybody lies. Everybody lies but it really helps you in basketball. Because you know if you're a 6 2 guy I mean what does it matter if Hojo's 5 9 or 5 11 he smokes the ball out of the park. But you could make some money if, if you know, if I'm a 6-2 guard, but I'm a 6-4 and a half guard, people are going to think differently of you, aren't they? It's a good question. I mean, Wes Unseld was always listed at 6-8. He was really 6-5. Is there a difference between 6-11 and 7 feet half inch? I don't know. Most people can't reach that high. <laughs> <laughs> Two and one to Darno. I mean, really, once you get to that rarefied air, how many people can check? <laughs> That's right. But five nine five eleven, I can I can figure that out. I'm five eleven. I'm gonna text Hojo tonight. I'm gonna tell him I got on him, and uh, <laughs> I want him to tell me the truth. See now he might be five nine now. Seattle's playing well right now. He might feel five <laughs> eleven. And now Darno is fussing with Vanover. I don't know if it was D uh, Darno as much as the bench. In fact, Darno got between Vanover and the bench to try to dissuade some of the back and forth. He was uh, uh, the great mediator right well, there. He's got to get calls for his guy. Two on, two out, two and two to Darno. And he hits one past Fister, but there's Espinosa to make the play to retire the side. Mets get two hits and leave two. Still three nothing Washington in the fourth.
You can follow every Mets game with MLB.com at bat on your favorite mobile phone or tablet. Get live look ins, instant replay, scores, stats, audio, free MLB.tv game of the day, and more. Download on the App Store or visit Mets.com today. Ian Desmond hit a bullet to center field that Lagares caught his first time up. Desmond leading off in the bottom of the fourth. Harper and Espinosa to follow against John Neese, who gave up three first inning runs. And then he misses with the changeup and falls behind Desmond 2 0. It hardly seems mm. possible that the Atlanta Braves went on a western swing to L.A., San Diego, and Seattle and finished 0 and 8. Boy. But that is certainly a boon for everybody else in the East and most particularly the Nationals who despite not playing particularly well still have a three and a half game lead and they had their best pitcher going today Atlanta. You know Julio Tehran took it on the chin. And our friend Chris Young keeps rolling along 10th win today. Good for him. And the fact that he's been able to stay healthy all year, the most important thing for Chris Young. So the Braves now find themselves limping home just two games over 500, with the uh, the Marlins closing in on them, only two games behind for second place. Lined into right, Granderson coming on, sliding, and he makes the catch. Nice play, Curtis Granderson. Desmond with two bullets to the outfield and he's 0 for 2. Well we get a great view of that from where we're perched here in the booth. Saw Curtis make that decision. Make a quick reaction. And then make a real tough play look pretty easy. That's a big out for a pitcher. So one out and nobody on now Bryce Harper who grounded out to do to his first time up. Matt Williams went on his weekly radio show today mm. and was asked whether the Nats would consider sending Bryce Harper to the minor leagues to try and get himself right. And I I guess that Matt did not say no strongly enough. So he got asked again today by the writers when he got to the ballpark and then he got kind of upset about it and he said no we're not doing that. And what he said is he said you know normally with a young player you would certainly consider sending a, a player down who's struggling and and who has options he's 21 years old. He said not this guy. He said he's a different he's a special guy and we're not doing that. And I don't know if that's a disservice to Bryce Harper or not to yeah. put things in well, those that's, terms. That's what I was thinking about is. Uh, I mean, he looks lost right now. He looks lost, and uh, you know, and we showed the Sports Illustrated cover of the Chosen One, and there's a lot to live up to. Uh, maybe sometimes quieting all this noise and letting him go dominate some place, like the Mets have done with Las Vegas with a lot of the young players. Well, there's a bullet off the bat of Harper, and he's got his first hit in this series. Well uh, the one thing about Harper he didn't miss the mistake there. What are you going to try to do after last night. Just try to pitch him away. Can't reach the ball out there. He's late on the fastball. Jonathan though is missing with his control a little. That's the perfect place. Tries to repeat it. Doesn't happen. Right down the middle. So if you make your pitch in that outside quadrant mm -hmm. low ish. You can't touch it. That ball was right down the middle. Here's Danny Espinosa and he's threw three fastballs by him his first time up. This one's lifted to left center. And overcomes Lagares to call for the second out. So two away, Harper still at first, and now Jose Lobaton.
Obertone grounds it out to Murphy his first time up. He's a switch hitter, a little better from the left side than from the right side, but not particularly potent from either side of the plate. Did have two hits last night, though. One of them a, a gift when Osdrubal Cabrera got hit by the ground ball that cost the Nationals a run, and by rule, Lobatone had to be awarded a hit. I, I do have to say, though, Lobatone's hit the ball pretty hard in these two games. Uh, with not a lot to show for it other than the uh, the Karen off Cabrera. Change up lifted to center and Ligaris is right there waiting for it. And that retires the side. A hit and one left after four and three nothing Washington. Kirk Neuenheis will lead it off against Doug Fister, who's had a pretty good groove going tonight. A guy who certainly had trouble last night, but did his job, Zach Wheeler. And, you know, we've done in the past, we've taken him as pitcher in the middle of the year and kind of followed him throughout the week to kind of see what their routine is, not only physically, but mentally throughout the week from start to start. We're going to do that with Zach Wheeler this week. Good time to do it after yesterday. Such a strange start, right? Clearly didn't have his best stuff, but he found a way to get through it and only allowed one run, which was really, really impressive. And so I spoke to Zach today, the day after and you know he said you know last night I'm sitting there in my bed at night and I'm thinking you know um, what I want to do better and he said I think for me it's really recognizing my body and what my body is telling me there's an easy tapper and Fister over to cover new and highest retired for the first out he said you know in that second inning last night I threw 33 pitches and, and I knew something was off but I didn't know what it was was I flying open was I staying back I knew something was off and he said if you go back and look at the tape I was taking a long time because I was really trying to figure it out on my own turned out later as we saw uh, you know in the papers today Dan Worthen looked at video on about the third inning and then told him and he started to self correct it the rest of the way but he said that's what I'm going to try in my bullpen just to learn my body a little bit better I learn about my body what it's telling me a little bit better. So what did he do today? Really the day after is about running a flush run. They get all the toxins out coming running around the field. Sometimes he'll do pole to pole. He said then the key is a big massage. I'll go massage for a while. Hot tub cold tub and then the final thing is a leg workout. Probably going to tone it down today though because I'm feeling a, you know, a little weary in the legs. You, know, you got to learn again. Learn those cues from your body and maybe change the routine a little bit as the season goes on. So we'll follow Wheeler all week. His thoughts leading up to his next start. Nice to have you back, Kevin. It's great to see you guys, even though currently you're 7,500 feet in the air and I can't see you. But I saw you earlier. So great, that was good. Great stuff, Kevin. It's, I, I'm always fascinated by uh, every pitcher and, and their difference, differences uh, in between starts and what makes them uh, kind of tick. You know, uh, the Mets uh, uh, in today's game uh, are just so fortunate that most teams travel with the masseuse. So he's there uh, at all times. And that's a, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of fighting over who's, uh, who's on the table. 
for Antuna Ligaris. Well, what about the, the whole notion of Wheeler? First full big league season. You're into August now. How do you amend what you do between starts to account for that? Mm. It, it, it's a hard call. I think it has a lot to do with your personality, Gary. Another strikeout for Fister. Um, and what I mean by that is that there are a lot of, uh, of pitchers, and I played with pitchers that did nothing. I'm talking about nothing in between starts. I played with guys that have, have done more than their fair share. Uh, it's whatever makes you tick. Me personally, I had to do everything in between starts the same at all time because if I got down that checklist once the start came I could say you know what I went down my checklist I did everything I was supposed to do so I've taken that factor out of the start you know because if you have a bad start and you didn't check off one of the things you go you know what I didn't do my due diligence that's what I'm paying for I didn't I didn't take that three mile run the day after I didn't uh, make sure I did my band work so um, that's my personality it wasn't everyone's personality seems like Wheeler has more of that kind of personality. And how do you learn as a young pitcher what works right for you? Is it just trial and error? Trial and error. And I, I think uh, uh, I don't think I was answering your question. As it gets later in the year, you listen to your body. If your body says, boy, you need a little bit of a rest, um, you do that. Sometimes your body says you need more sleep. you got to do that. Desmond throws out Tejada. Fister's got himself a 1 2 3 top of the fifth. And we're halfway through in Washington with the Nats up 3 0. Spoken starter to the energetic closer get an inside look at some of the Mets new young talented arms and the unique stories behind their journeys to the majors on Mets Insider presented by W.B. Mason Sunday at 5 p.m. only on SNY. Doug Fister leads off against John Neese in the fifth inning. Fister grounded out to short his first time up. That's got him three runs to work with in the first inning and he has run with that. Neese meanwhile has settled down somewhat. And not allowed anything since that first inning. As you look at the Jeep fifth inning recap, Adam LaRoche with the big blow, a two run homer in that three run first. And Fister has done the rest, holding the Mets to three hits through five. As he bids for his 11th win of the year, which again is pretty remarkable when you consider he missed the first five weeks of the season. I mean, weren't you interested in the winner when the Nationals traded for Fister? Didn't you think, what a great trade that is? I mean, how did they get Fister from 
the Detroit Tigers. Well, it's still an open question. How did they get him? It's not as though they gave up, you know, substantial prospects. They gave up three players. Um, Ian Kroll, who we saw a little bit pitch out of the bullpen last year. Left hander. Right. Um, uh, Steve Lombardozzi, who is a, a nice backup player, nothing more. And Robbie Ray, who I guess has the most potential of all of them. Yeah, he is that uh, young starter they think is going to mature into good one. Well, I think two things happened. One, I was surprised they traded him because uh, you don't know the status of Scherzer uh, after the season. Uh, but what they thought, the Tigers, they wanted to move Smiley into the rotation. Right. And that's why they thought that Fister was expendable. David Wright running right to the railing and can't get to it. Well, it's turned out to be a great deal for the Nats because not only does it make a strong rotation even stronger, but it gives them such a different look than they have from the rest of their four starters. And if Detroit doesn't trade Fister, maybe they don't, they don't go trade for David Price. Right. Price made his debut for the Tigers last night. Ultimately successful for Detroit as Fister strikes out on the eighth pitch of the at bat. Second strikeout for John Neese tonight. Well, it shocked a lot of people at the time. Right? No question about it, considering how well Fister pitched with Detroit last year 14 and 9, 3.67. And I think it was another one of those trades, Gary, for the Nationals this offseason where people went, Boy, embarrassment of riches now. This even uh, ensures that the Washington Nationals are going to win 100 games this year. Well, with all the things that haven't gone right for the Nationals, Fister is one of those that has. Yes. I mean, think about it. You know, I know people tend to downplay wins and losses these days, but nobody in the National League has more than 13 wins. And here's Fister with 10, and he missed five weeks. Somebody saying to themselves, "Well, Kershaw missed a whole bunch of time, but he's on a he's on a different different level." Yeah, they're they're going to call uh, Kershaw up to the next league. They're trying to form it right now. Well, that's um, players who change teams in the offseason. Scott Casimir has the most wins with Fister and Cologne in that company as well. Denard Span had a base hit the other way his last time up, one for two on the night, and he's. It's that one in for a strike. Did you find it interesting Kershaw was a little testy last night when he kept being asked about Mike Trout. What do you think about Mike Trout. He, the, the, he goes um, the Angels are a very good club. Mike Trout's a very good player. I'm not going to talk into talk about Mike Trout and Clayton Kershaw. I faced the Angels not Mike Trout. I thought it was uh, it was it revealed something in Kershaw's personality that he doesn't want to get into this. Game of. Uh, uh, stars against stars. He's a, a team pitcher, and he didn't have his best stuff last night, but grinded it out over I think seven innings or so. Dodgers pulled it out in the bottom of the ninth. Pujols hit his 513th to tie it up last night, which moved him uh, past Ernie Banks. Right. Span sharply to Tejada. Two out. Final game of this series tomorrow afternoon. Jacob DeGrom tries to continue his phenomenal rookie season against the guy that I consider to be the ace of the national staff. I know you could go in a lot of different directions, but Jordan Zimmerman is just so difficult. Uh, Ten to one almost with that case. The I, I think he's the best, too. He hasn't had as much luck this season. To me, he reminds me a little bit. Of Matt Cain in his heyday right. with San Francisco. He should always have a better record, but they don't always uh, score tons of runs for him. Just that guy. Yeah. Here's Anthony Rendon. I mean, I know Strasburg is supposed to be the ace of the staff and he leads the league in strikeouts. But for me, there's there's something missing there. Zimmerman, there's a certain toughness with Zimmerman that I think uh, most people who watch the game and Know what they're watching, uh, uh, find appealing in Jordan Zimmerman. Oh, and two to Rendon, who doubled and scored in the first, grounded into a double play in the third. John Neese, who pitched into the ninth inning in his last start against the Giants, threw just 87 pitches. It was such an odd game for him. Here he is at a similar pitch count 
in the fifth inning. It's like 10 pitches an inning, wasn't it? It was. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, every <laughs> every batter hit the first or second pitch. Rendon down the line, and he's got himself his second extra base hit of the night. So a two-out double for Anthony Rendon, his 31st double of the year. Well, an 0-2 pitch. That's too good by Jonathan Nice. Rendon is one of those guys with two strikes. He. Uh, I wouldn't say he's a more dangerous hitter, but he has a great two strike approach. Gary. So six hits now for the Nationals. So sorry, Gary. I think one of the great things about about pitching hitting in a game is that John, uh, Jason Worth his first time up took the first pitch from Jonathan Neese. Hitters love to set you up and make you feel as though you can get that first strike in. I doubt he'll take this pitch. He'll be real aggressive against Jonathan Neese here. Looped a single to drive in Rendon his first time up, then drew a four pitch walk in the third. Worth was the National League Player of the Month for July, just as he was last year. It's funny because I was looking back at Worth's career and Remember he had a career that started in fits and starts because he was hurt so much early on with the Dodgers and then he went to the Phillies where he was more of a complimentary player. But it kind of stunned me when I realized that here's Jason Worth who's 35 years old. Yeah. Terrific player. He's been on one all star team mm -hmm. one. And you know why because he's a great second half player. Generally doesn't have the big first half numbers that get you on the All Star team. It's like being a a, a decent a good player on the Mets in the 80s. You weren't going to the All Star game. You know it was Gary Carter, it was Keith Hernandez, it was Dwight Gooden and Daryl Strawberry. Uh, no one else was going to go to the All Star game. They were locks. Well, Worth suffered from that with Utley, Rollins, and Howard. Right. And East finds the inside corner with that cutter, two and two. Well, I thought Worth would be aggressive. I didn't take into account that Nice would pitch him almost perfectly here to a two and two count. Ball's right on the corner. Rendon at second and two out, and Worth hits one to the right side. Murphy handles the hop, and that retires the side. So Nice gets through the fifth, keeps it a three nothing game in D.C. Think the wild card matchup should be one game or three games. 
<laughs> Hashtag SNY tweet. Interesting question. Interesting and personal, I think. John Neese leading off in the sixth inning. Well, there are a lot of factors that play into that, right? Well, I don't know. Like to me, Angels are playing outstanding baseball. They're still behind the A's. If you don't win the division, you risk facing Felix Hernandez in a one-game playoff. Right. He's called out on strikes. He walked away before Larry Van Orvin told him to. <laughs> Six strikeouts for Fister. And I guess the question is, is it fair? Geez, everything's so fair now. Why not have stuff that isn't fair once in a while? Well, there are a lot of other factors, <laughs> too. I, the one thing I look at is if, if you have the wild card teams playing best of three, now everybody else is sitting and waiting yeah. and maybe getting stale before the postseason begins. There's Curtis Granderson is over for 2. And the other thing is if you push back the postseason three more days to accommodate a best of three now when's the World Series getting played in November. Granderson dropping down a bunt and it's a beauty Rendon not in time. Well, Rendon did everything he could. An outstanding play by the Nats third baseman, but Granderson snaps his 0 for 18 with a bunt single. I mean, Rendon did everything you could, but just the speed of Curtis gets him there in time. Boy, this is just so beautiful to watch in so many ways. A perfect bunt, an excellent defensive play, nice by LaRoche, and no manager coming out to dispute the call. <laughs> With like the right call by Dan Iasonia at first. So Granderson snaps that 0 for at 18. And the Mets try and build something off that here in the sixth. Just their fourth hit. Daniel Murphy's gone 0 for 2, grounded out, and was called out on strikes. Fister almost impossible to run against. And he throws the curveball up and in. He has not given up a stolen base since last August. In fact, the last man to steal. Against Doug Fister was Eric Young in the game that Fister pitched against the Mets last August at City Field. Now, the question is how can that tall a pitcher, as Murphy drills one toward the right field line, but that's foul, how can that tall a pitcher be that good at holding runners on? Well, we, we've seen the history of it uh, that they are not because it, it takes them a while to unfurl that big body towards the plate. The difference is if you watched. Fister take his last at bat. He's really a good athlete, tremendous athlete. So he's a guy that has good baseball instincts, even though he's a pitcher. He changes things up. He'll move quickly. He'll quick pitch you. Murphy with a base hit, and the Mets have the have a couple of men on here in the sixth. See Fister with his head down. That was really, boy, maybe the first mistake he made tonight. Just a kind of loose. Fastball or cutter inside to Murph, and Murph did not miss it. So the Mets get David Wright to the plate as the tying run. David blooped a single to right his last time up, one for two on the night. Granderson at second, Murphy at first, and one out. And David with a good swing fouls it back. Boy, another mistake right there by Fister. You don't get a better pitch to hit than that. It's amazing as the Mets get more aggressive, they're getting better swings, they're getting base hits. You know, this is one of those games where you have to be aggressive against a pitcher who's always around the strike zone. Espinosa hanging out sort of in the neighborhood of second base. Now he backs away and Wright takes just inside. A ball and a strike. Lucas Duda, who's two for two tonight, looming on deck. Mets have been behind 3 0 since the first. And Wright fouls it away. 
One and two. One two. And right fouls away the cutter. See him tapping his leg, Fister. What does that mean? It means he's not pushing off. Very lazy to the to the batter. And three of the four pitches now have been up in the strike zone to David. Wouldn't be surprised he comes back inside with that sinking fastball. Tries to keep it down. Fister has struck out six. And the curveball bends around the plate. Two and two. Good choice. David has not seen any breaking ball. Was surprised by that, but it was inside. Good call by Vanover. Randerson at second, Murphy at first, and one out. Two and two to David Wright. And he bounces one foul. That got in the dugout. I don't know. Bartolo might have made a play with the towel. He's very resourceful. You know those towels are good for more than just celebration. It better be. Seventh pitch of the at bat coming from Fister to right. And David hits it sharply but right at Rendon. The turn by Espinosa for the 5 4 3 double play that gets Fister through the inning. Second one, they've turned around the horn tonight. And the Mets are turned aside in the sixth, still 3 0. Adam LaRoche leads off in the home sixth inning. Pops up the first pitch he sees from John Neese. Ruben Tejada puts it away. One pitch and one out for Neese in the sixth. Let's check in with the studio. Eamon McEnany has a game break brought to you by your local Tri Honda dealer. Not pictured. Ike's two run double in that first inning. Miami's got some fight in them, don't they? They do. Kristen Yelich with a home run tonight for mm -hmm. them. And Ian Desmond goes after the first pitch and drills a base hit to left center. So Desmond, who had two bullets to the outfield that were caught, finally finds some grass. 
He's got a one out single. Bryce Harper coming up, and we check in with Kevin. Well, tonight for Las Vegas, Noah Syndergaard is getting the start. And why is that important? Well, he's coming off his best start of the year down there. I spoke with Frank Viola, um, he, you know, coming off that start, shut out, did so many things well. And he said, you know, I think really the thing for him this year has been he's never struggled. And and when he had struggled at other times, all he did was get up 97 miles an hour, and, and that got him out of every situation. And, and Frank said, you know what? That doesn't play in AAA all the time, and that's where he struggled. He said the curveball right now is a start-to-start -start thing. Some starts it's great. Some starts it gets a little slurvy, so he's working on it. And throw it out is not nearly in time. So stolen base with Harper at the dish. It's Desmond on second. We'll take a look at the replay here. You know, Kevin uh, Darnell got a good pitch to throw again. He, it's a common occurrence, and uh, every throw he throws is sailing, uh, which means he's not uh, getting in the right position to throw. And Desmond did come well off the bag, but Tejada just had too far to go to try and get back to him. But anyway, on Syndergaard, his last start, guys, he threw out of the 70 fastballs he threw, 63 were first strikes. And maybe the most impressive thing about the, that outing, according to Viola, was this. At one point, he threw a changeup to get a strikeout. Obviously impressive to go with the confidence with that pitch to get a strikeout. Maybe more impressive, though, is that Kevin Ploiecki is the guy who called it on his own. So some cool developments for the Mets' youth developing a triple-A. Well, Kevin, uh, what I can say to that, and I'm just so excited, uh, one, that Frank's health is, is good, but two, that he's down there with some of those talented pitchers because uh, he's got the expertise, he has the back of the baseball card, he's got the personality um, to really help those kids. I know Montero is coming off a big start in last night's ball game. I think eight shutout innings could be wrong. But uh, uh, I, I, just to have Frank as the caretaker of these young pitchers is uh, something that's a real good thing for the Mets. Harper gets called back. He thought he had ball four. Well, Vanover calls it a second strike. You know, these histrionics that uh, Harper goes through, and I'm not saying he's wrong that it wasn't a ball, um, you, you just can't do it at this level. Uh, it's just... Uh, it doesn't go over well. Now, is that ball outside? Well, maybe it is, but it's been called a strike for most of the night. You just come back to the plate. Wait for the umpire's call. Yeah, he kept walking a long time after Vanover called it a strike. That's not a good thing. He's learning this year that no one's bigger than the game. That's how it goes. Desmond at second, 3 2 to Harper, and Harper gets that call. Ball four. Second walk of the night for John Neese. There was a day, Gary. Well, that pitch would have automatically right. been a strike. If you argue, if you argued with the umpire, anything close would have been called, and you got the benefit there. It's Buddy Carlisle up and Dan Worth and out. I want to go back to to Syndergaard, um, yeah. Ronnie, because it's almost axiomatic, right? Yeah. That you want your young pitcher to struggle at some point so that he can learn what that's like and learn how to correct what's wrong. Is is that? Is that valuable or would you rather just see him dominate and come to the big league? No, I, I think it is valuable. I, I think that there's a two things that are valuable uh, being um, two things that are valuable being in the minor leagues as a pitcher. I can't speak as a hitter. It's that when you are on a hot streak, how can you perpetuate that? How can you turn a three game win streak into like a five game, six game win streak? And the second thing is, is when you're in trouble, and you've lost two in a row, how do you snap out of that? Or within a game, how if you're struggling within an inning, do you stop from giving up three runs and only give up one run? Those are all the things that you are learning on the minor league level. So when you come here, it becomes uh, you know, easy. Danny Espinosa at the plate with two on and one out. And he's been able to throw his fastball by him all day. And I just want to add one quick thing in there, guys, because Ronnie, you talked about Frank Viola, and he was doing great. He's excited to be back, but he said something that I thought was so cool. He said, My first thought when I was out is, Well, wait a second, who's going to take care of my guys? <laughs> you know, very fatherly. It was, it was very neat. You know, the one thing about Frank, and I'll never forget this. 
is he was fully evolved as a pitcher when he was 20, 21 years old. He knew how to paint the corners. He knew how to change speeds. And all of that is going to help, even with the great power arms uh, that the Mets have. Espinosa drives one deep left field. New and Heist back, and it's out of here. Three run homer, Denny Espinosa. And the Nationals have broken it open. It's now 6 0 Washington. Seventh home run of the year for Espinosa. Well, with that big leg kick, really the only thing that Espinosa is trying to do is hit the ball out of the ballpark. And he caught this little changeup. And Nice has thrown a lot of changeup this game. And hits it in the front row. This is the part I don't understand, Ronnie. Nice has thrown his fastball by Espinosa all day. Horrible choice of pitches. I, I, there's no other word to say it. Now, does that mean he doesn't throw the changeup? No, but you bounce it. Right. You have to bounce it. Lobaton hits it hard, but foul. You have to read the bat, and Jonathan has enough uh, time in the major leagues. Is that the hitter sometimes tells you what pitch you can throw? If he's behind on the fastball, then you continue to go that way. That means that if you go to the slow pitch, which is more in his bat speed, it's got to be out of the strike zone. Now I know the argument you'll get from Jonathan and, and from the club is that pitch was down. Uh, it wasn't a strike. Well, it wasn't down enough. Lobatone takes one the other way. Granderson coming on to get it. And that's the second out. You know, two home runs against John Neese tonight. Both have come with men on base. Roche with a two run homer in the first. And now Espinosa a three run shot here in the sixth. And yeah, now Fister will bat with two out and nobody on. Now six runs to the good. Mm. Well, John Neese has never lost four consecutive starts. Never in his major league career. Unless the Mets have a huge rally in them. It's going to happen to him for the first time ever. Well, I got a stat from you, Gary, earlier because I couldn't find it. 45 and 15, the Nationals are when they score first. But more importantly, when they score four more, four more runs, they're 51 and six. Well, that's how good their pitching is. Yeah. Not just their starters, but their bullpen as well. So another rough day at the office for John Neese and. To get through this inning as Duda takes care of Fister, and for the second time, Nice failed to cover first base on a ground ball. Six nothing, Washington.
Declaration of Independence. It's hiding in that little chamber there. That's the Jefferson Memorial. Renaissance man, if there ever was one. Monticello, architect. Jason Worth has come out of the game. Steven Souza takes over in right field. Worth's been bothered by some ankle problems. Duda cues one up the third baseline. Fister's toss, and he got him. Wow. It's quite a play by Fister on that little cue shot off Duda's bat. Told you he was an athlete. All six, eight of them. And that ball came off the bat. I don't think he had any chance to throw Duda out. It must have been the old basketball drills for hmm. Doug Fister. First time dude has been retired tonight. Shuffle your feet. Don't give up the baseline. <laughs> well, Fister comes from an athletic family. You know, he played his college baseball at Fresno State. His dad played football at Fresno State a generation before. That DNA stuff, it's an amazing thing, isn't it? Jason Worth is another one who you talked about exiting the game. I mean, his entire family tree has professional and Olympic athletes. Of course, he is related to the Schofield family. Dick Schofield, the, the younger, was uh, drafted my year, shortstop for the California Angels at the time. Later Anaheim played, Angels. Uh, later played for the Mets. Oh, he did? Yeah. I did not know that. That's your, your dark period. Oh, I know. I, you know, the dark period uh, as we go along was a lot longer than I thought. <laughs> you know Lennon's weekend in L.A. that really lasted about three months? That's really what my period is, <laughs> just without May Pang. Deep fly ball to left. Harper back. He'll have room. And Darno retired two out. Check out SNY.TV for an inside look at Jets and Giants camp with up to the minute news, interviews, and player profiles, plus a complete breakdown of all the latest developments straight from camp on the JetsBlog.com and BigBlueBlitz.com, all part of the SNY.TV blog network. And Dickie Schofield played for the Mets in 92, right after you left. He was their starting shortstop that year. Well, the dark period, folks, started for me as a Met around 90. And I know I was on the team, but it did start around 90. Right uh, right when Julio Valera came Yeah, the up. Julio Valera period. Um, not Julio's fault. No. Of course, my fault for not being better. Um, it started then. And then once I was uh, traded to the American League, I let it go. Kirk Neuenheis 0 for 2 tonight. Fister comes upstairs 1 and 2. Fister has struck out 6. Which matches his season high by the way. He's just he's not a strikeout pitcher. Has not walked about it tonight. He's given up 5 singles. He's gotten a couple of double plays to get him through some difficulties. And he has been exactly what he's been all year for the Nationals. Diving stop by LaRoche and from his knees throws out Neuenheis. So LaRoche who declined the dive last night on Murphy's ball this time leaves his feet and makes a terrific play. That helps Fister to a 1-2-3-7. Stretch time 6-0 Nats.
SNY is brought to you by State Farm. Today's State Farm agent of the day is Pat Cauley of Glendale, New York. Contact Pat's office at patcauley.com. Does he have that picture on his wall? <laughs> by Cure Auto Insurance, rates should be based on how you drive, not your credit score. Cure Auto Insurance, drive well. And by Mazda, conviction, creativity, courage. This is the Mazda way. You go on a trip to 40 Universal Orlando Resort where you'll enjoy the action and fun of two amazing theme parks plus stay on site at the new Universal Cabana Bay Beach Resort. Just go to SNY.TV slash Toyota and enter the Toyota Fan Flyaway Sweepstakes for your chance to win. Get to City Field Sunday, August 17th for Family Sunday when the Mets take on the Cubs at 1.10 p.m. The first 15,000 fans will receive a Mets batting practice cap courtesy of Gulf. For tickets, visit Mets.com slash Family Sundays. 36-year-old buddy Carlisle comes on to pitch for the Mets as we go to the home seven. Well, his numbers have been fast, fantastic despite going back and forth from the Mets to Las Vegas for the veteran Carlisle. As Carlisle gets himself ready for the bottom of the seventh, we check in with Kevin. Well, you guys, I want to go back to what you were talking about the last time the Mets were in the field. And, Ronnie, you brought it up after the stolen base by Desmond Darno on the throwing. He looks mechanical. And I spoke with Bob Guerin about it nearly two weeks ago. And... You know, what he told me is what, what Darno had been doing. He said he's been working with him since the spring, so it's not anything new, but it, it almost feels like he's so all of a sudden trying to change things. But anyway, he said since the beginning of spring training, what he's been trying to get him to do is to kind of set up with your left foot slightly in front of your right foot. And he said how he wants it to go is after you catch the ball, what you're supposed to do, take the initial step with your right foot, push forward, and that gives you some more juice on the throw. He said what Travis has been doing um, is basically catching it and almost falling back on the right foot to so kind of like picture a quarterback throwing off of his back foot into coverage so you don't get the the mustard on the ball but it seems like now all of a sudden he's trying to kind of incorporate that and he's caught in between so that's what they're trying to do but it's clearly not smooth right now the question is how do you how do you fix that on the fly during a season it's going to be hard to fix it on the fly I think that's going to be something they'll fix in spring training only Eli is the New York athlete can throw off his back foot in this town well, if Darnell had David Tyree, it might be all right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Murph could catch it against his hat, I'm sure. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Undoubtedly. <laughs> Denard Spann, one for three tonight. Murphy, no hat necessary. One out. <laughs> You see the numbers on Travis this year, just 10 of 47 thrown out. You know, the elite in the league, uh, you're talking about Yadier Molina. Uh, those guys are around 35% plus. Yadier at times is around 50%. You can't even compare them to, but you want to be in the one third range. You want to be in 30, 30% range. And of course, those numbers are so dependent on your pitcher's ability to hold runners close. Anthony Rendon a pair of doubles tonight one to right center and one down the left field line. You're right Gary but I judge it like this is that you have to have the wherewithal as a catcher is that especially with the guys like Desmond who slide across the base every single time you are working towards perfection. What does that mean if they have a big jump they have a big jump but get in your position to throw and throw a strike to second base because if the more times you do it the easier it'll be and you'll be able to advance and get to a point where you will throw out runners. I mean, you make a great point. That last stolen base by Desmond, if he puts that ball on the bag, even though Desmond had a beat, he would have been out. Yeah, especially the way the game's played now with the replay. That's become a big play. Ramos for the Nationals this year around 40%. A lot of quick pitching from Buddy Carlisle, who's using all the tricks of the trade. Steven Souza. Who took over for Worth in right field is on deck. I wore that number that Carlisle has for my rookie year, 44. Hated it for the entire year. It's a slugger's number. Exactly. And I have feelings exactly. I wish you were around those times, too. I got to talk to you about it. Speaking of sluggers <laughs> and the number 44, do you see who pitched for the White Sox in the ninth inning last night? Was it a donkey? It was fun to watch. Adam Dunn going to the mound. With his team down 15 to nothing. 
we've seen that Robin Ventura has no problem putting uh, everyday players out the throw. Carlos Torres in the bullpen. Deep to right center, but Lagares has it lined up. Two out. This has been a record year for everyday players taking them out. Well, you know why? Because managers get so aggressive using their bullpens yeah. every time they get into an extra inning game. This is what happens. I mean, it used to be you'd hold somebody back, your long guy, to be your innings guy in extra innings, who would go six, seven, eight innings if necessary. Mets did it last year with Sean Markham on a couple of occasions. Right. But nobody seems to be playing that way. That's how you ended up with a tie in the All Star game back in uh, in Milwaukee, whatever year that was. Two thousand two thousand two, 2002, I think. Was that long ago? It was the year after Seattle, two thousand and one. That's how we led to now it counts. Well, we've got 180 players playing now. <laughs> Bring a guy off the street. But the other thing that used to happen in long extra inning games that managers seem very reluctant to do is you, you run out of relievers, you take the next day starter, you stick yeah. him in there, let him finish the game. Oh, pitch count, Gary. Don't get on that one. And and somehow if you do that, the pitcher might break in the 18th inning. Well, then have the EMT guys just make sure that they're close. <laughs> The, uh, I think though with a guy like Adam Dunn, don't you think it's he's always maybe said to his manager, if there's ever a shot to get me in to pitch a game, I'd love to pitch an inning. Well, Adam Dunn was a great high school quarterback. This one's drilled down the line, hooking toward the pole, and just foul. Steven Souza came that close to his first big league home run. Well, that was a lot closer than I thought it was. Maybe that's why Sousa kept running. Sousa had some monstrous numbers playing for Syracuse in AAA this year. You still have the same ballpark in Syracuse? That one with no. the uh, locker room in right field? Macar uh, MacArthur Stadium, yeah. that, that's gone by the boards. Sousa hit 354 in AAA with 18 home runs in 91 games. OPS over a thousand and that's in the International League which is not as good a hitters league as the Pacific Coast League. It's taken Sousa a while he was. Uh, he's been in the Nats farm system since he was drafted in 07. Now 25 years old. Trying to do it maybe for this team that Tyler Moore did two seasons ago. Be a guy off the bench with some pop. Play some outfield, some first base. He's even played third base in his minor league career. And Carlisle ready to quick pitch, but Souza this time asks for time and gets it. It's amazing because hitting is so important to young players as they in age. We have tons of these guys that come up. And they can play three and four positions, but they don't have a position. Spend a lot of time in the cage, hitting off the tee, working on the craft of hitting the baseball out of the ballpark. And then when they have time to take ground balls, they don't always do that. It's like the guy who goes to the weight room all the time and misses Tuesdays and Thursdays, never does his weight training on his legs. Ends up with a big barrel chest and big arms, Gary. Tiny little legs. Gotta have balance in life. <laughs> Susan lifts one to center. Easy for Ligaris. And so Buddy Carlisle has himself a 1 2 3 inning, and that sends us off to the eighth, with the Mets still looking to get on the board.
matchup should be a one game or a three game playoff. Let's get a sense of what you guys think. Like Ron said, Mariners. Oh, so he says three. Okay, I missed yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just trying to get through that in a hurry. It looks like a more than 140 characters. <laughs> You just you just don't want to believe anyone that would agree with anything I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, not even slightly. Okay, so this gentleman, Dan Cohen, note the name, two ends, believes three is more fair yes. because of the Felix factor or the Kershaw factor, as it were. I'm conflicted because uh, I'm with you. I'm conflicted because the three uh, game playoff seems so much more fair and it really gives a better indication of what team is the better team moving forward. Here's team another one. Teams to make the playoff even as wild card teams should feel like they're in the playoffs with a real series. One game it creates excitement. It's like you're skipping the game seven right away I like that. Mm -hmm. I, I just uh, it, it's a hard one uh, to, to wrap your brain around wild card should Absolutely be one game all or nothing with teams back against the wall. You want leeway win the division love it. Oh Little flare into right field and Ligaris has himself a leadoff hit So the Mets have their sixth hit Well, those are the standings in the AL West the A's and the Angels with the two best records in the American League But one of those two is going to be a wild card team, but that being said this is what you're going to see with the one game playoff. You're going to see John Lester, Garrett Richards, Felix Hernandez. I mean, that's pretty cool, but. Well, uh, but right now, Seattle's not in that second wild card spot. Toronto, Toronto is. is that's right. So you got to face maybe face RA in a one game playoff. I don't know, you know if that's who John Gibbons would go with, but imagine that having to face a knuckleballer in a one game playoff. R.A. is going to have about 140 quotes before that game. <laughs> Matt Thornton, who just joined the Nets today, is up in the bullpen for Washington. Tejada's 0 for 2, struck out and grounded out. And Ruben hits it sharply. Another chance for Rendon to turn a double play, but a low throw, and everybody's safe. Well, the Nats have turned two, five, four, three double plays tonight, but that one not quite handled cleanly by Rendon, and then his low throw couldn't be handled by Espinosa. Well, he's a young player, and once he bobbles that, no need to rush. You have the lead at six nothing. What you should do there is make a throw that's going to be at the bag, and Espinosa should not be trying to turn it. He should be trying to catch that ball and just get the force out. They tried to take a real tough play, make it a fancy play, and they got no outs. So it's an error on Rendon. Now Eric Campbell will pinch hit with two on and nobody out. Campbell has done a great job as a pinch hitter. Falls behind in the count. Nothing and one. Carlos Torres getting ready to pitch in the bottom of the eighth inning. Campbell 7 for 15 pinch hitting this year. Got a start in left field yesterday. Campbell uh, does always a fine job of trying to hit the ball to right field when he's a pinch hitter. It's that ball they're trying to work him away, but Fister's just the opposite. He has been crowding him in the first two pitches of this at bat. Lagaris at second, Tejada at first, and nobody out. Curtis Granderson on deck. Fister has struck out six. And he gets the call third strike on the outside corner a season high seven strikeouts for Doug Fister fastball in fastball in paint away. That's the good out. Good morning. Good afternoon and good night. So one out. Matt Williams on his way out to the mound left hand hitter and Granderson coming up. Lefty Matt Thornton up in the bullpen. Fister working on a shutout at 101 pitches. And he is going to come out of the game. <laughs> Call to the bullpen brought to you by Verizon. Matt Thornton will make his Nationals debut coming in for Fister when we come back.
Terrific outing for Doug Fester. He's out of the game after seven and a third scoreless innings. Matt Thornton comes in to face Curtis Granderson and fires a fastball for a strike. Well, Thornton uh, has been outstanding. What a career he's had. He hasn't pitched less than 55 games in nine years, and this year he's already at 46. This is his 47th, so probably going to do it for the 10th year in a row. Dependable, always been an eighth inning kind of guy, specialty lefty. Granderson just three for 21 in his career against Thornton. Still throws hard enough, throws 95 plus, but there was a time when he used to bring it up there around 100 miles an hour. His numbers with the Yankees don't look bad on paper, but they let him go on waivers, allowed the Nats to claim him, and he's now the third lefty in that Washington bullpen. He's going to do fine over here because because of the three lefties Gary he's going to get that one lefty in the, the middle of the lineup and that'll be it. Here he'll face two because of Granderson and Murphy back to back. Unless he gets a double play ball by the way Granderson is not grounded into a double play this season. None. Ooh. And he got. Jammed off his thumbs. Well, it's either get hit in the stomach or foul it off. I mean, that's one arm swing. Mm. He's pulling the emergency ripcord. Two on and one out. And Granderson lifts one to left center. Harper is there to grab it. Two out. Check in with the studio for a game break. Eamon McEnany standing by. Eamon? Giants two and a half back in the West. Milwaukee a game in front in the East. In the uh, Central, I should say. Mm -hmm. Here's Daniel Murphy with two out and two on. Interesting. Thornton talking to a Lobatone. A uh, Lobatone probably trying to say, hey, listen, are you comfortable with Murphy? Do you know how you want to go after him? And and Thornton either said yes or no. <laughs> but fastball away. Murph against lefties will go that way with it. Murphy's first ever at bat against Thornton in a big league game. Two out and two on, and Murphy takes a knee high strike. Murphy one for three, single to center his last time up. Nats got three in the first, two of them on an Adam LaRoche home run, and then three in the sixth on a Danny Espinosa three run homer, and that's been plenty. And Thornton quickly ahead on Murphy 0 and 2. Thornton reminds me a little bit of you remember Arthur Rhodes. Yeah. Uh, had a long and storied career but every time they tried to have him close it didn't work out so well. Well it's like Thornton. Thornton's always been great in the eighth inning. O2. And Murphy with the emergency hack fouls off the breaking ball. David Wright would be next. Pretty nice when you're 37 years old and you can come in through a 96. Well, sometimes it's hard to. Uh, tell, but he is a big boy out there. 6 6, 235. 1 2 coming. And Murphy fouls it away. That's the same pitch he threw at Granderson just in after all those pitches away. Hey, we have a first uh, Cholula of the night. Congratulations, Matt Thornton. Is that the oldest pitcher ever to get a Cholula? An outstanding question. It's the first guy from Grand Valley State University ever to get a Chulala. That's somewhere in Michigan. Here's the one two. And Murphy just manages to get a piece to stay alive. The change up from Thornton at 90 miles an hour. 
Lagares at a base hit. He's at second. Tejada reaching on an error. Vister able to get the first out and Thornton the second. This will be the seventh pitch of the at bat to Murphy. And Murph gets the benefit of that call, two and two. Two out, two on, two and two to Murphy. Toward the hole, Espinoza can't get to it. Around third comes Lagares, and he'll score the first Met run of the night. So Daniel Murphy sneaks an RBI single through the hole, and now it's six to one, Washington. 48th run batted in for Murphy, his second hit of the night. Well, Espinoza does the right thing here. As an infielder, you want to try to keep that in front of you so the run doesn't score. Good jump with two outs by Lagares. You shouldn't be peeking at the ball, which he doesn't, just going hard and scores the run. Boy, Murph shouldn't have Mets across his uniform. It should be two hits or bust. I mean, that's what it is every night. Three straight two hit games. So he'll keep his batting average over 300 for another day. Here's David Wright with two out and two on. David is one for three tonight, a fly ball single in the fourth inning. Final game of this series tomorrow afternoon at 12:30 start. We're on the air at noon with our coverage here on SNY. Jacob Degrom tries for his seventh win against Jordan Zimmerman. And Thornton quickly ahead on right. Well, he got ahead on Granderson 0-2, got ahead on Murphy 0-2, and, and now he's 0-2 on right. Todd Clippert is up in the Washington bullpen. The thing with Thornton, he's got a good fastball. I would say his breaking ball is not his best. So when he gets ahead, can he put you away? 0 oh, 2 to David. Right at Desmond, and he makes the flip, and that ends the inning. Mets get an unearned run to crack the scoreboard, but it's 6 1 Washington going to the bottom of the eighth. The Braves finish an 0 and 8 road trip. Ball 7 to 3 to Chris Young and the Mariners. Pirates got four in the first. They're up 5 3 on the Marlins in the bottom of the seventh. And you saw it change just like magic. 
The Reds now up eight nothing. Wow. Over the Indians trying for their second straight shut out of Cleveland. Carrie that's what we do. We're on top of it. Carlos Torres on to pitch the bottom of the eighth. Oh I'll try to be on top of here. Carlos Torres in the pitch this ninth inning. Oh, sorry, bottom of the eighth. It's inning. almost the ninth. Though. Bottom of the eighth inning. <laughs> we'll get there. No <laughs> problems. Adam LaRoche delivered the big blow of the first inning, a two-run homer off John Neese. And the Nats have not looked back. LaRoche, Desmond, and Harper for Washington in the bottom of the eighth. Neese went six, allowed six runs, eight hits, two walks, two strikeouts, two home runs. And unless the Mets have a big rally in them in the ninth, Nice for the first time in his career will lose his fourth straight start. Mm. I think it's going to be a drawing board kind of uh, um, aftermath for Jonathan Nice. I mean, it has to be. You know, his. His style and way of pitching has filtered around the league, and I'm talking about attacking him early in the count, early in games. Uh, it just happens every single time. We watch it happen. Ross Detweiler is up in the Washington bullpen. So there's two ways to combat that, Gary. One is to uh, be a, a little more careful on the first pitch, mix in a little more curveballs, first pitch strikes early in the game. Or second, use that aggressiveness against the opposing team and throw better quality pitches, and maybe you'll get some quality first pitch outs. Long fly ball, deep center field. Lagares back, and LaRoche has his second home run of the night. Fifteen on the year for LaRoche, who has snapped big time out of a slump in these two games. It's now seven to one, Washington. First multiple home run game for a national this season. Looks like a little change up or at least a slower breaking ball from Torres. That's the bat speed for LaRoche. He's the guy that can't handle the real good fastball but likes that breaking pitch. And Desmond tops one toward right. Tough bare hand stop and he got him. What a play by David Wright. A very difficult bare hand pickup and he throws out Desmond. Spectacular play for David. David's the best in baseball. And how does he do it? Well, he does it because he has the ability to those big, strong hands not only come up with that play, but get rid of it so quickly and on the mark. I don't know anyone I've ever seen make that play better. Boy, to pick that ball up on the short hop off the dirt like that after playing back. It's amazing. almost like he does it in one motion, Gary. So one away now Bryce Harper who's one for two in a walk. Mets one run and seven hits the Nationals seven runs and nine hits. And that's with three home runs tonight including a pair from Adam LaRoche. Twenty third time in his career LaRoche has hit more than one home run in a game. Hmm. So if I look back on the Mets and the Nats and you try to come up with some themes on why in the last 13 games well sorry 12 games to 12 10 and 2 they uh, and winning this game could go to 11 and 2 as the ball comes on the field they know all about that in Cleveland hmm. is a few things one the bullpen has been better for Washington over the course of those games that might change now with the Mets a stronger bullpen. Uh, Zimmerman and others have come up with huge hits late in games uh, to decide the games. And the third thing, which is uh, I, I find um, the one that is the most appalling for me, is every single one of these Washington hitters is extremely comfortable. There's nobody who ever has to back off. There's no one that is put on their fanny. Uh, LaRoche and Harper with that swing. Did you see that swing right there? That would make me angry in a 6-1 game. It should make the Mets angry. 
Rose strikes out Harper with a breaking ball two out. It's like what the hitter is telling you is that in this game now I'm just going to swing out of my shoes and hope I hit one 500 feet and uh, that would not be appealing to me that would make me angry and it should make the Mets angry. And where does that come from does that come from an individual pitcher does that come from manager pitching coach front office. I think that you get to a point where you're so comfortable um, and work so hard to throw strikes and that's a good place to be. But you also have to recognize there's a game within a game. This team has had its way with you and they are going to try to win the division. Well how do you stand up to a team you let them know that you're in for the fight. There's there's no reason in a game like this that you go OK I'm watching you guys swing I'm not taking it. Try this one on for size and I'm not talking about hitting anybody. Not at all. But you're also not going to swing from the bottom of your shoes every single time up like this is home run derby. Game's changed. I know that. Well not necessarily I mean just think back to the last half inning. And the pitches to Granderson and Murphy that nearly broke their thumbs. Well, that's why Washington do, has been doing it better. They do pitch in. Fister, that's how he won the game tonight. He threw, what, 40% of his pitches inside to righties and lefties? That's how he won the game. Espinoza had the game breaking blow. That came in the sixth inning. Hit a three run homer off John Neese, his seventh of the year, to make it a 6 0 game. And it's been a cruise for the Nats ever since. One two from Torres, and it's too high. The first time we ever saw Danny Espinosa, he had home runs from both sides of the plate against the Mets. It was here, right? Yeah, September. In his, he's just been called up maybe a few days before. Dylan G pitching that game? Can't Probably not because Dylan always beats the <laughs> yeah, Nationals. Yeah, right. <laughs> Little flare down the line, foul. And it looks, you know, I mean, Espinosa has tremendous power. He's a terrific defensive player. And it looked as though he was going to be a star, but by last year, he was back in the minor leagues hitting under yeah. 200. So it has not come easily for him. And he goes down on strikes on the curveball, so back to back strikeouts for Torres. But Adam LaRoche with his second home run of the night makes it 7 to 1 as we go to the ninth in D.C.
presented by Hospital for Special Surgery. Daniel Murphy with two hits and the only RBI. Lucas Duda with two hits. But the Mets not doing much against Doug Fister, who gave up just an unearned run in seven and a third. Coming up after the postgame tonight, Brian Custer will have Geico Sports Night. All Mets and Yankees and Jets and Giants. Incomparable. We're incomparable now. Well, that's Brian Custer. He's, that's, he's the one of the nicest guys on the planet. That's really overstating the case, don't you think? Uh, by leaps and bounds. <laughs> Ross Stettweiler will lead, will uh, pitch the ninth <laughs> inning. Lucas Duda takes inside ball one. Duda two for three tonight. I know your big thing is to watch Brian when he does the Jets post game. You love that well, show, right? All over that. <laughs> I mean, that that's must watching. Not so much after the Jets win, but after they lose. Really? Oh. Gotta watch just for Klecko. <laughs> Where's Joe from? Philly. Uh, Philly, uh, yeah. Because he's got a real distinct accent and I mean I love it. I mean Joe Klecko, you gotta love anything. I don't want him to be mad at me. But Ray Ray Lucas oh. is very opinionated. Well the ang love. the anger that comes off Ray when when <laughs> the Jets don't play well, particularly if the quarterback doesn't play well. Well that's his expertise. Oh, he's awesome. <laughs> he feels your pain. You know, it's been a long drive spell. <laughs> I know you keep telling me that every year. This is ninth year in a row you've told me that. Well, it's been a lot longer than that. You just were listening earlier. <laughs> I mean, January 12th, 1969 was a really long time ago. 2 2 to Duda, and he's down on strikes. So Detweiler comes in and fans the first man to face him. One down in the ninth. Well, good sinking fastball from Detweiler. I mean, embarrassment of riches. You have a, a left hander out there that two seasons ago. Uh, was one of your five starting pitchers. He had probably his career year, and they put him in the bullpen this year, and he's cleaning up a seven to one lead. Down to Darno takes a strike. Darno 0 for three tonight. Now just two for his last 24. That's put up six runs and 11 hits last night, and they're. Victory in the first game of this series. Darno takes one the other way, and Souza makes the dive, but merely manages to knock it down. And Darno has a one-out hit. Well, nice try by Souza in right field, and a much-needed hit for Travis Darno there. I'm thinking Darno probably gets the day off tomorrow, right, Gar? 12:35 game. I think there's a chance of that, but. I don't know. It's not a guarantee. Well, when I, when you talk about now three for twenty five, probably could use a day off. Maybe. Chris Young will pinch it, batting for Kirk Newenheis against the left hander. Newenheis went 0 for three tonight. Robbed of a hit on a great play by LaRoche's last time. Chris started last night in right field. Went one for three in a walk. Well, I would say that Travis will either sit tomorrow or he'll sit Sunday, which is also a day game after mm. a night game in Philly. I can't imagine he'll sit both. Interesting, huh? Five game series against the Phillies last time you're in town and a four game series this time. Well, they only managed to get one game in the first trip. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Which is what led to the five. A little pop up. Sousa coming on and makes the sliding grab. Two out. Well, he couldn't make the diving catch on the last one. Here he uses the worth like slide to catch the pop up by Young. Well, you like the aggressiveness by Sousa to come in and make this play. And if you're a right fielder for Washington. 
You got to slide on that play. So the Mets are down to their final out of the night. Juan Lagares is one for three, single to right, and scored the Mets' only run in the eighth. So it looks like it'll be a rubber game tomorrow afternoon with Jacob DeGrom on the mound. And the Mets have had no better formula lately than DeGrom on the mound. Six and one over his last eight starts. Just pitching brilliantly every time out. The ball and a strike to Lagares. Detweiler trying to close it out for Doug Fister, who would have his 11th win against three losses. Fister with his effort tonight lowered his ERA to 2.49. He still doesn't have enough innings to qualify for the league leaders, but he'd be right around fifth in the league. He's getting there. Yep. Two one to Lagares. And he flies one out to right. And Souza waiting for this one to come down. And that ends it. The Nationals get even with this in the series. Doug Fister with a terrific pitching performance. Adam LaRoche with two home runs. Danny Espinosa, a three run shot. And the Mets with little answer as the Nats even up the series seven to one. Well, Fister just came out throwing and punching strikes in there one after another. The Mets couldn't counter. And Jonathan Neese just didn't have it today. A couple of home runs given up. Uh, the big blow, the one to left field late in the game from Espinoza, which really sealed the deal. Fister now 11 and 3 with the win. Neese falls to 5 and 8 as the Nats and Mets will play a rubber game tomorrow afternoon. Washington wins this one 7 to 1. We'll come back with.